Hello, and welcome to the Relationship Renovation Podcast. Last week, we explored when one of the partners is the one who has that really dynamic uh, mood range where there's a lot of ups and a lot of downs, a lot more extreme in their moods. This week, we're talking about the partner who can be a little more flat, you know, that person who doesn't have that much variation. And we're going to talk about what are the challenges if you are that person, and what are the challenges for your partner if they see you as somebody who's just a little more flat. So it's going to be really interesting. It's going to give you some practical tools for you and your partner in your relationship. Go ahead and stay tuned. Hello, all, and welcome to the Relationship Renovation Podcast. I am Tara Kerwin. And my name is EJ Kerwin. And we are doing a follow-up to how to deal with your moody partner or your non-moody partner. <laughs> yeah. So so last week, we had a really, I, I thought it was a really interesting episode where we talked about when your partner, when there's one individual in the relationship who has really dynamic moods, who there's a lot of ups and, and a lot of downs, and, and there's maybe even a, you know, a high level of expression of those moods as well. And in our relationship, that is terror. My term for it is high maintenance emotionally, emotionally high maintenance. <laughs> yes. And proud of it, baby. <laughs> and we, you know, we gave some great strategies around that, trying to help people understand it from both sides, because it's not easy for either partner. It's like, it's, mm -hmm. I know it's not fun for terror in those moments. No. And I know for me, like I, it gets really overwhelming and I don't always know how to deal with it. Or I, I didn't know how to before. And I've gotten much more skilled. You have, it. you really have. Thank you. That and feels I do good agree to hear. that it was hard for you, but I get it. I really get it now. So, yeah. And so this week we're kind of doing the flip and maybe I'm on the hot seat a little bit more <laughs> because I am not a highly expressive person. There is a lot less variation in my mood. And maybe a clarification there is not necessarily there is a less variation in my mood. There is less demonstration of my mood. I like that reframe. Yeah, and I think that there's a lot of people like this out there. There's a lot of people who for, you know, maybe it's just their neurobiology, maybe it's their attachment history as kids, but they've learned to be just very subtle in how they express what they're feeling mm -hmm. or maybe really disconnected. Mm -hmm. Avoidant. Yes, maybe it may be a little avoidant <laughs> as well. That comes from love. I mean, so maybe Tara would be great for you to start because you observe it. You've known me for, you know, 12 years. You know, you've observed how I deal with my emotions or do not deal with my emotions. Gosh, where do I start? I think I'll start maybe early on. You know, we were therapists together at an uh, eating disorder residential facility and and I literally was like just amazed by how you did this processing with clients. You know, it could be a teenage girl, it could be an older female, it could be a couple during family program, but like you just knew everything to say and be with them to help emotionally regulate them. And I'm just like, wow, he is freaking awesome. And little did I know, you know, a year and a half later, we would start dating and then we would be married and have a blended family together and have twins together. And I'm thinking, man, I freaking won the lottery. Not only did I like I marry a fellow therapist, he's like really freaking good with, you know, supporting people in their emotions. And I, I'll never forget the first week, our first date, it was a tailgate U of A football game. And I've met your parents and I had told you, like, I'm just letting you know, I'm high maintenance emotionally. Like I am one very roller coaster of a woman. Type but, of gal. And you're like, bring it, I'm ready. Okay, of course you are. <laughs> um, fast forward, right? We had a great honeymoon period, year and a half. Fast forward to when our life got very stressful and we you know, had the twins and they had colic, blah, blah, blah. If you guys have been listening to all of our podcasts, you know the whole story and then some. And I became very overwhelmed. You know, I'd have my little like moments when we would argue before stressors happened. I remember I once called you like a Buddhist mofo. I'm like, why, why don't you get angry? Why can't I trigger you? But then I was like, you know, he's just chill, man. That's just like EJ. He's just like a little Buddha. Well, that completely, that idea, that visual of, for me went away when our life got very stressful and 
I felt very alone in it because I would just see you with this deer in the headlight look and you would almost freeze. And then I was like, what is going on? Like, where is my EJ? What the hell happened to him? And and I would try to like understand like what's going on for you. And you would always say nothing. It's fine. Like you are. And I was just trying to keep these two humans alive. And so we just got into this very like unhealthy dynamic. And, you know, that led to us being like, wow, this is really hard. How can we build a center to, to help couples? Because this is really hard, but we have to learn how to do it first for us. You know, and so I started to express my needs of like, I see what happens when I get uncomfortable and I'm already judging myself so much. Like, I need you to like be there for me because if I'm not, like, I can't handle this. Like, I don't feel supported. I feel alone. And for me, it was like crisis situation. Like, I can't be in a relationship where someone's avoiding me and making, not making me feel, but I felt very alone. And I think because you love me so much and you love our life and you know that we are meant to be together. Like you, instead of running away, you started to really actively look at that. But I also had to actively ask you to look at that because I thought that you would just know because you're this therapist that helps really like hundreds of people in, in an amazing way. And then I was like, actually, that's not true. EJ's a human being. He's got feelings. They're locked away somehow. I don't know when he's mad or happy or joyful or angry or I know nothing. And it's not my job to figure it out or caretake him, but it is my job to challenge him in healthy ways to show up for us in our relationship. Did that, was that a good? Yeah. There are some people who, one, they're just wired that way. You know, they're they're just less dynamic in their movement from mood state to mood state, Right. But it's also what I see is it's a created mood state and it's an adaptive mood state. When people grow up in households where there's a lot of conflict or where there's an individual in the house who has more extreme movements in mood, it creates sort of an internal feeling as a kid that you having moods is not safe Mm. because what I want to do, and, and this is kind of back to me, is like, I want to avoid creating conflict, you know? And I think this folds very closely into, into conflict-resistant uh, individuals or conflict-reluctant individuals is, is that oftentimes people use their lack of expressing their emotions as a way to keep them safe. And oftentimes what it does is it does keep them a little bit safer in their household, but but it also becomes something that other people recognize as a strength, you know. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people are really drawn to that. And and I've I've sort of always had that before, even before I was a therapist, and even in my career when I was working in the media and entertainment industry, where there's a lot of really dynamic people, I was always very steady. You know, and if people got, you know, were really upset or reacting or there was a really stressful thing going on with a band or whatever, I was the one who was like not reactive and was just like, hey, we can, wait a minute, let's like really think about this. Let's really be thoughtful about this, you know, and even girlfriends throughout, throughout my life, they, you know, cause I did, I've always been drawn to not always, but a a lot of the women I dated and girls I dated when I was young were really like emotionally up and down type of type of women. And (laughs) they, they were drawn, I think, to my, to my steadiness. Mm -hmm. And then, and then it really helped me in my career Mm -hmm. of being like a really steady person. And then I became, you know, and then I sort of reinforced it and I became a Buddhist at a really young age and meditated and, and really, cultivated that ability to breathe through things. And then I got, I think, confused between being non-attached and not reacting and being detached and avoidant avoidant of difficult things, right? And so then I became a therapist. And then again, that's like a great skill set for a therapist is that like I can be around people who are in deep places of suffering. I can be around couples who are in high levels of conflict and I can stay steady. Like it, I don't react to them and I don't get frustrated and I don't get overwhelmed in those moments, right? Well, then, 
you know, I got into a relationship with Tara, who was a person who wanted to know what was going on with me. Mm-hmm. Also wanted me to be able to stay emotionally present in those difficult moments. Mm-hmm. And my skill set as a therapist, as a, you know, as, as a person working in the, in the entertainment industry was not directly transferable to my relationship with you. And also you growing up as a child, like you, you know, that's the way you being safe was like not having emotions. Yeah, of just keeping things really close to my hip, figuring it all out on my own. It was just something you had, you know, cultivated for safety, for protection. And then it was brought into your professional life and your adult life in like this perfect way until me. (laughs) And then when, you know, when we went through those difficult times and then when you would like, you know, say things like, you're just a deer in headlights and, and, and what's going on with you? You got to tell me, like, it was a real mind scramble for me. Cause I was like, well, but that's just going to create more problems. Mm-hmm. You know, the, you couldn't trust. I, I had a really hard time trusting. I still do. I still have a hard time trusting that I can have an emotion that's uncomfortable, recognize it, express it, and it won't, turn out with a negative result. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of conflict avoidant people and and so it's it's interesting because we talked you know we're talking about two things we talked about this the last time that there's like a characterological mood state and mood swing that people have but then it's reinforced by their families and by by their professional life, right? And I'm having to learn to recognize my more complex feelings, find words for them. Mm -hmm. And this is the hardest part Mm -hmm. for me than taking the risk to go ahead and say them. Yeah. What have you noticed from taking the risks? Because it is an emotional risk to basically feel safe in one emotional identity and then say, well, actually that's not helping in my intimate relationship. So in order for me to feel deeply connected with my partner, I'm going to have to kind of strip away what I know to be so safe and familiar. What have you noticed? I've noticed that when there's positive feedback on it, when you really can hold me in a safe place when that's happening, when you cannot personalize it and be reactive to it, that it feels really like, being seen and heard sort of what it feels like for the first time. Mm-hmm. That it's doable, actually. That it- Yeah, and I've learned that it's still like, you know, and, and this is what I tell all my couples I work with whenever they're making these like really fundamental shifts in themselves and in their relationship is it's still, I tighten up when I'm talking about it because it's just like, it's still really hard. Like I have to like, like sometimes there'll be something that's on my mind for days days Mm -hmm. that I just have a hard time. And it's so much of it is like, I'm constantly gaming in my head of like, when's the safe time? When's the right time? You know, especially in that dynamic where, where we have like, that maybe you occupy more space mood wise, that I'm like looking for this downswing where I can come in. And so it's it's still, it's just like, it's really challenging and it's hard to determine when am I being avoidant and when am I being like, you know, mindfully strategic about it. I mean, I think that's just, you keep trying and you start to take these emotional risks and then your beliefs start to shift if like, you know, 60, 70, 80% of the time your partner can meet your needs. You know, but if you're not taking the risk, saying what you're feeling, what you're needing, then you don't even give your partner the chance. And so that's where it, yeah, you know, you just keep doing it. You just keep doing it. Like you told me, you said, Tara, like, you know, so EJ, uh, he runs a boys camp over the summer. It's like his 16th summer and he just loves it, but it's, you know, he hires all the counselors for it. And so between like February and May, EJ like has a different level of stress. And he said, hey, I'm just letting you know that time is ramping up. So I'm probably gonna start to be more stressed. And ever since you told me that, 
I was like, okay, how do I support EJ? Because I know he's going to have another level of stress added on. And he already does so much anyway. And so it's just been on my mind. And I was so happy he told me. I was like, oh, so now I get to like help you because you've helped me so much. It feels so good to help someone. That's the thing. When I didn't know how to help you when you when it felt like you didn't have any needs or you didn't need anything because you were the stable thing, I felt like, okay, I guess I'm just crazy. But now that I know that you need support too and that you have emotions and you struggle and you get uncomfortable and you're not this just Buddhist mofo, I love it. I feel like I have a job in a good way, yeah. like that we get to support each other. So then it feels more balanced. Yeah. It's interesting because since you asked me that question, like how has it been or whatever, like I'm I'm ruminating over and over with it. And I'm realizing like another significant part of the problem for me and maybe other people who can be conflict avoidant and who who struggle to, you know, identify and express their emotions is that like I also like don't even know what I need in those moments. Like I have no idea what, you know, I talk, you know, with my couples all the time about creating positive feedback loops, right? That you are able to express something to your partner, your partner knows sort of what you need in those moments. And that by doing that and them supporting you in that way, then it becomes more easy for you to express yourself again and again. And it's like, I just don't even know, I don't know what I need. Like, I don't know, like, it's so foreign for somebody to like support me. Hmm. You know, I've been doing a lot of work around this recently, around the fact that like, you know, just from a pretty early point in my life, whether it was in my family or school and and then eventually relationships, I've always been so Mm self-sustaining. I've just always felt like, you, EJ, you just gotta figure, figure your shit out on your own because nobody else is gonna do it for you. So just keep your shit tight and do it. You know, I, I have this like internal, like ruthlessly individualistic approach to life. Like, and it's just like, it's hardwired into me. Mm-hmm. And so like, even when times when you are being supportive, even that is is foreign to me because I'm like, what do I do with that? Like, what no. you know? Do do I want that? Do I not want that? You know, like, it's really confusing. Like, because I don't know how to accept support. I don't know even what I want when it comes to support. Thank you for sharing that. So, just listeners out there, know this is like the first time EJ's opening up to me about this in this way, and so it feels very helpful for me. Because then I can talk about what might be helpful, right? Since you, since it is foreign, how do we start to learn a new language? You know, this is the curiosity piece. But I wouldn't have known to do this if you wouldn't have just said that this just now. Well, and this work that that we do with couples, and that you and I are both doing individually, and that we try to do together, it's so like complicating and confusing and subtle. Like, you know, it's easier when it's just like code word, you know, when it's just like, Mm -hmm. hey, when things are going completely sideways, we say burnt toast and we have a little protocol and that helps. Mm -hmm. Like that's really concrete for me. And I can, Mm -hmm. you know, I can implement that. And a lot of couples, you know, have an easier time understanding it and using that tool. But when it comes to like really these more subtle things about like, why am I the way I am? And why do I have, you know, personally this feeling of just being very alone most of the time? Mm-hmm. Like, why, why is that? And how does that process work? It's, it's not easy work at all. And so, like, it's interesting because you said, like, I've never heard this before. Like, I'm just getting here myself in understanding how I work so I can explain it to you. You know, and that's where like we we have this sign in our uh, lobby that says, you know, your partner is your greatest teacher. Be patient for the lesson. And that's where that patience is so important because way back in this process with you was you just saying, you're a Buddhist mofo. (laughs) Oh, I know. What is your problem? Like show up. Yeah. And I was reactive instead of curious because I I didn't know. Yeah, And I was reactive because I was like, what is she talking about with like this has worked in my internal system and I'm, I've am i had to be patient with my own process and I've been appreciative because Tara's been mostly patient with it, you know, with, <laughs> with occasional kicks hey, in the ass. I asses. would say over a decade is pretty darn patient. Yeah, yeah. Well, now and, and just, you know, kind of to conceptualize it really is 
knowing that you're doing your work and that you're starting to open up to me more than you ever have, like, and trusting that I do have you, I've got your back, I want you to keep doing this, like, that is what is helping us shift to become deeper. But if I wouldn't have known any of this, I would have still been reactive to your avoidance and I wouldn't have had that compassion. But now my heart, even if you don't know what you need in those moments, my heart is so compassionate for you because you're recognizing that this is a process for you, but that you're really trying. And so that's the biggest piece. Like partners, if you have a partner that is a little more avoidant or detached or whatever, you've got to find a way to be curious and compassionate. They're not doing that on purpose. They're doing that because like EJ said, he's hardwired to be more individualistic. Like I got my own shit. I don't need anybody. But that's not true. We we all need people. It's research shows without love, without human touch, we die. Yeah. But we got to support each other in that. We have to help each other. And and so today, just to sort of recap, I mean, really what we took a deep dive in today is one, what is it like when you're in a coupleship where there's one person who is just less expressive of their emotions? There's not much variance in their mood swings. What it also led to is sort of a deeper discussion about, about avoidance, about conflict avoidance in a relationship. And so if this is something that you're identifying like with your partner, like, yeah, this is something we struggle with. This is a dynamic that affects our relationship. We encourage you to just have a, a wonderful, loving conversation with each each other about it in a non-blaming, non-accusatory way, but instead in, in just like a super curious way. And I just want to say, EJ, while I'm looking at you and your beautiful eyeballs, oh, thank you. I love all of you. I'm here to support getting all your compartments into one. Yeah. And yeah, I just want you to be able to be whoever you need to be with me. Thank you. Sweetie. That is the beauty of an intimate relationship. It's the two of us. You don't have to be it with anybody else, just yeah, me. Yeah. I got you. I got you too. Yeah. You should see his uncomfortable stance, me just saying I'm that. Squiggling. He over had here. to immediately say, I got you too. All right. Well, thank you everyone for listening. And this was an amazing topic. So we really just want to hear your thoughts, your feelings. Was it useful? Any feedback, any sharing these episodes with your friends, giving us ratings on our podcast page would be amazing yeah and take care of yourself take care of one another oh you flipped it okay I flipped it on you girl i know so did changing I. Okay. the dynamics we are okay change is good sometimes <laughs> <laughs> all right bye bye me and you just singing on the train me and you listening to the rain me and you we are the 